Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Yang berbahagia Datuk Sri Isham bin Isa Sekretari General Ministry of Defence Yang berbahagia Laksana Madia Datuk Sabri bin Zali Presiden of Puspahanas Yang berbahagia Major General Datuk Haji Muhammad Nizam bin Haji Jafar Komandan of National Resilience College Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Datuk Sri Datuk Datuk Esteemed Panelist of National Security Seminar 2023 Distinguished Guests Ladies and Gentlemen and the online participants that join us using webinar Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning With heartfelt appreciation for the blessings that have allowed us to convene I'm honored to welcome you on behalf of the Commandant of the National Resilience College to this esteemed National Security Seminar Today we explore the whole of government and whole of society approach WAGOS towards national security prospects and challenges. We are particularly privileged to have the Secretary General of the Ministry of Defense, Yang Bahagia, Dr. Sri Isham bin Isha, join us for this important discussion. Yang Bagi Tan Sri, Dr. Sri Dato Sri, Dato Dato, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Yang Bahagia. Major General Datuk Haji Muhammad Nizam bin Haji Jaafar, Komandan National Resilience College to deliver his opening remark. Please, yang berbahagia Datuk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Yang bahagia Datuk Sri Hisham bin Ishaq, Sekretari General Ministry of Defence, Vice Admiral Datuk Sabri bin Zali, President of National Centre of Defence Studies, Yang bahagia Tan Sri Wahid Umar, Chairman Bursa Malaysia, Yang bahagia Datuk Dr. Shazlina Zainal, Under Secretary for South and Central Asia Division MOFA, Yang bahagia Prof. Dr. Muhammad Faiz Abdullah, Chairman ISIS Malaysia, Cik Nazim bin Rahman, CEO Defence Service Asia, that also provide our smart partnership in providing online platform for NRC today. Datuk Sri, Datuk Sri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen. Today we make our mark and register the importance of this seminar. Our session today not only presents by the participants in this hall, but also join us at this time by online participants. And to both participants, welcome to the seminar. We are privileged as our Secretary General be able to be with us despite his busy schedule. Your presence, Datuk Sri, is a recognition to us. This is your first time visit to NRC and Puspahanas. We welcome you with our warmest heart, Datuk Sri. Today, the topic is a whole of government and whole of society approach towards national security, prospect and challenges. Yang bagi Datuk Sri Hisham will certainly be able to give us his valuable insight on this particular topic as he has experienced working in different environments from different ministries before this. His thought will certainly become the key factors into steering the main discussion later delivered by our key speakers today. And we hope the concept that we're talking about today will be the talk of the town and the topic discussed and debated of late. But how does this concept that can draw the line of correlation with national security context? How the different ministries, private sectors, international relations be able to mitigate this complex web of wogos? By now, it should not remain merely a concept, as today we will hear how best it can be implemented and be part of us and how significant for this concept to be embedded in us and the positive impact once we embrace and adapt this concept. It should not be like a beautiful lyrics from famous songs, but it should be something that reachable, accepted and be implemented. Today, in this very hall, represented by various ministries, private sectors and Kedah civil service. Thus, this is the best venue in discussing the way forward for Bogos, the prospect and challenges. Each one of us, the participants, will be able to contribute as they are the catalyst of change and the bridge to foster better understanding of the whole concept. To Datuk Sri Hisham bin Ishaq, 
our Secretary General, thank you for your presence to give the keynote address for this seminar. To our eminent speakers, Yang Bagi Tan Sri Wahid Umar, who have been our regular speaker to NRC from cohort one. So as Yang Bagi Professor Dr. Muhammad Faiz Abdullah agreed to scrap his other engagement just to be with us today. And of course, Dato Dr. Shazrina, the lady behind the success story of IDFR and now the Undersecretary for South and Central Asia. I have the privilege indeed to welcome Datuk Sri Hisham bin Isa, our Secretary General, to deliver his keynote address. Yang bagi Datuk Sri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Datuk Sri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala syafi'i anbiya musalin. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yang bahagia, Vice Admiral ada tak? Vice Admiral Datuk Sabri? Tak ada? Ada, oh Datuk Sabri bin Zali, President National Center of for Defense Studies, Puspahanas. Yang bahagia, uh, Major General Datuk Haji Muhammad Izzam bin Haji Jaafar, Komandan, National Resilience College. Yang bahagia, Major General Datuk Abdul Rahim bin Haji Yusof, Head of Academic uh, MKN. Uh, we have... I would like to recognize the distinguished panelists that we have this morning together with us. Yang bahagia Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, Chairman of Bursa Malaysia Berhad, whom I think should have been given the opportunity to give the, uh, the speech tonight instead of today instead of, instead of me. But we also have Yang bahagia Professor Dr. Muhammad Faiz, uh, our renowned Chairman Institute of uh, Strategic and International Studies, our ISIS. Yang bahagia my good friend, Dr. Dr. Shazlina, Sainul Abidin, Director General, uh, Institute of Diplomacy and Foreign Relations. Yang bagi Tansi Tansi, Datuk Datuk, Latin Latin, Distinguished Guests, Participants of the National Security Seminar, and of course, uh, uh, SS uh, Kedah. Uh, thank you for bringing a big delegation here this morning uh, uh, for this uh, event. So first and foremost, uh, I was given the task to give the keynote address, and we want to talk about whole of government and whole of society. And, uh, for everyone's uh, information, this is not a new topic. As best as possible for today's event, we do not want to say that this is something new that we want to introduce. Way back during Tony Blair's uh, uh, prime ministership, uh, the, the concept of uh, bringing in many inter-ministerial, inter, -ministerial, inter, inter concept or approach was already introduced. Singapore introduced this uh, whole of government and whole of society approach way back in 1990. So today we have this program talking about whole of government and whole of society. There's something that, that we should not say that is going to be newly introduced, but it's something that we need to perfect ourselves in making sure that war goes, uh, uh, works for us. We have IC in front of us today, uh, many ministries, agencies, departments. And the fact that we are here today is to do one thing is to bring our resources together, our knowledge, our financial, our people together, our thoughts, our mind, and more importantly, our leadership together in making Wagos work. One thing that we have in common in this room is every ministry has its own security or safety measure or concern about making sure that the security and concern is taken care of. The former ministry that I was in, in Ministry of uh, investment, trade and industry, we spoke, although we spoke about FTAs and, and the likes, but we always also remember speaking about economic security. Ministry of Finance, they will speak about finance security. We hear a lot about Ministry of Agriculture today talking about food security. And of course, Ministry of Health speaking about health security. So the common norm that we have among all of us today is the word security but the application of that security is for different meaning, different use, uh, depending on the different ministries, departments that you represent. So that's one strength that we have this morning that we can bring together and make WAGOS work. That is the common use of the term security. But if we are going to have this conversation in this uh, institute or this uh, think tank, in Puspahanas, then it should not only be security about war. To bring people together to discuss about security, meaning to say that we have to understand those security uh, uh, 
mention from where they are coming from, be it health, economy, social security, food security, women's security, and, and the rest of the security. So bring them together and get that interest together so that we can now talk about the national security, bringing the topic of discussion of this uh, uh, event this morning to more bring it together and talking about something that is common among us, then you go to the national security. So that's my first advice for my uh, presentation or speech this morning. In 1990, when Singapore introduced WOGOS, what was happening then was they were transforming their agencies and ministries. So they were building silos, like what we are doing now. When government started introducing transformation in government ministries and agencies, what we were building is where we, we were building strength in every ministry, transforming them from being a non-performing ministry and agency to now a more performing agency, providing the best private, uh, people delivery system to the people. But over the years, we forgot that those silos remain as silos. So the challenge for us today is how do we bring the silos into one ecosystem, working as a whole of government and all of society. Even in uh, MINDEF, I'm just, I'm just in MINDEF for about one month, and I can see the silo between the civilian MINDEF and the military MINDEF. So now I'm trying to bridge that together to, to also install or, or try to push for this whole of government and whole of society approach. It's not easy to bring silos which we have been building for many, many years to come and work together and more importantly, to speak to one another. But yesterday, for the first time in my management meeting, I heard Dato Arman spoke about ATM being open to now talk with the civilian MINDEF to come together and join our resources together so that we can optimize the resources of MINDEF to achieve what we have been planning to do. In 2024, with a budget of 19.7 billion ringgit, it's not a small amount for MINDEF, but with the leadership of Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim, I can see a lot of differences being implemented in government. And this, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is the best time for us to take this opportunity to, from the support of the Prime Minister, to make WOGOS work. Why do I say this? Number one, in the past, for instance, in government procurement, We've seen appointment of agents when we procure our military equipment. 20% is already taken by agents and the min, man, ATM will receive the 80%. So if I'm buying a ship of 100 million, I lose 20 million to the agent. And 20 million for a ship is a big loss to ATM. You have a ship, but you don't have the necessary equipment or armament or combat, combat management system or fire fire management system that will make that ship something that we are proud and to put in South China Sea to defend our country. So with a whole of government approach, I am going to take this opportunity now for MINDEF to optimize our resources. I'm going to reduce those leakages. I'm going to make sure that we spend prudently and make that money that we save and I'll give back to MINDEF. Then you will have your equipment. You will have the things that you have been wanting for. And definitely, let's do away with these agents and go for what we have been striving for many, many years. About three weeks ago, there was a report about the, uh, uh, where MINDEF is in terms of strengths in ASEAN. And where do we rank? We were ranked number seven. So to me, that is something that I wouldn't want to be proud of. We need to be at least the top three in ASEAN in terms of military strength. Because the challenges that we face now are not single MINDEF issues. It is multidisciplinary, it is very complicated, and it's across ministries. We have Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MITI, MINDEF, uh, 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 Japatan Tana. So these are all complex, interdisciplinary, interministry uh, uh, issues. So the best use of WOGOS to resolve complex issues, interministry issues, interdepartment issues is through WOGOS. So today, I hope that we can find a way on how to execute WOGOS as best as possible. The biggest challenge that I see in implementing WOGOS today is leadership. 
Remember, we have silos. So we have little Napoleons, those little, it means also KSUs. Lah. KSUs who run those ministries, KPs who run those ministries, SS who run the states. So these I call little Napoleons or people who are in power in those silos. We need to break them and to bring them together. Leadership is one. So leadership here means not only that we need to have one single person who can bring all these silos together and to become this one single Wogos uh, uh, strategy to work. But we need to have those KSUs, those KPs, those SS in those silos to now open their silos, to talk to each other and to also speak to their constituent, to their people, to their community, to their associations that is around their ecosystem now to make Wogos work. Why do we need to do it now? Ladies and gentlemen, we every day we read, we watch on TikTok about what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Israel. We see what's happening in Ukraine. And today itself, this morning, we see not only Israel is combating with Gaza or the uh, uh, Hamas, but we see uh, Iranians, Iranian-backed uh, guerrillas in Syria, Yemen coming in. So the geopolitical uh, threat is really a real threat, not only in that region, but it become a threat to us. Look at Ukraine. Because of the war in Ukraine, we cannot, many countries are unable to import grain from Ukraine. And what happened? Let, let's take India. When they cannot import uh, grain to make uh, flour, uh, flour to make bread, so they have to secure their rice and they ban export of rice to Malaysia. What happens to us? We go around uh, crying because of the high price of rice. And do you know the impact of rice is not only the Republic. We have more than 850 military camps, camps around the country and, and we have concession contracts for them to supply food at our rumah rumah masa, and that has also affected us. So some may not see this, but that is already a threat to us. So Wogos, for me today, is something that it cannot be left out. It must be done, and it must be done in a concerted effort. And we need to find leaders who will carry this agenda, who will speak about this agenda, and who will come together, and not only so small ministries, agencies that come together, but leaders among those ministries must come and talk about Wogos. If not, we will be left out. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I spoke about in 1990, Singapore came up with this Wogos approach. In 1996, they worked together with Harvard Business School and they came up with a book called Dynamic Organization. In a dynamic organization, we, they needed those silos to become a good Wogos. Those silos need to be dynamic, performing strong and be able to communicate with each other. So it was like single missiles but they made that single missile very powerful. But single missile will not win the war. But you bring those missiles together as one system, that will win the war. So they worked together with Harvard and came out in, 20, in 2006, a book called Dynamic Organization. In Dynamic Organization, to create a dynamic organization does not come natural. It has to be created, created by leaders who understand why a dynamic organization is necessary. So they, come, they came up with three concepts to make the civil servants, the best civil servants that you see today in Singapore. The three things that they have taught every civil servant is number one, when you want to make a decision as a Wogos, you must always think ahead. Whatever decision you make today is not for today, but is for the short term, medium term, and long term. Always think ahead. So that you will not be making decisions which are reactive, but proactive. Secondly, when you as a leader wants to make a decision, then you must always think again. And thinking again is very relevant today in a Wogos concept. You look at the geopolitical issues that's happening today, Taiwan, Ukraine, uh, Iran, China, and US trade war, these geopolitical uh, issues or threats are affecting us. 
some may not realize it, but those who are on the ground can really feel the change, the impact. Like I mentioned to you, rumah-rumah masak kita, yang 850 camps sekarang, is really being affected because we do not have the supply of rice. 160,000 askar kita hampir nak menjerit lah mana nasi saya ni. Because India ban saja the export of rice. So thinking again is something very related because the decision that you make while you think ahead must always be evaluated, reviewed from time to time, changed so that you will make that perfect decision. And number three, that Singapore civil servants has always been promoting about whether to know whether you have made the right decision in thinking ahead, whether you have made the right decision in thinking again, is thinking across. Thinking across is where you want to set, where you want to make your progression, where you want to carry your ministry, where you want to carry your department, where you want to carry your army to. So thinking across means you have to cross-check among your competitors, your enemies, your nemesis, or whoever is competing with you so that you will always be on your right track. So thinking ahead, thinking ahead, thinking again, and thinking across are three very simple principles that are being adopted by the Singapore government in 2006 by a book introduced to all civil servants called Dynamic Organization. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us come back to WOGOS and the leadership in making WOGOS work. There's a book by Roger Nuremberg, uh, Roger Nuremberg, called Maestro. Maestro ni conductor yang, yang apa tu, conduct the orchestra. Now you know an orchestra is a combination of individuals who will come together, bringing their own musical, their own musical instruments, under the leadership of the maestro, they will produce the best music to the years. And that music as an orchestra usually is not only for public or normal, uh, local public consumption, it's always for global or international consumption. So an orchestra must have quality, must have knowledge, must have skills, must have this musical acumen to make sure that they produce the best music. So in Wogos, it's also the same. Let us look at all those people here in the room today. You are all individual musicians and you all have your own uh, uh, special knowledge in specific musical instruments. And these are the silos, the different ministries, agencies, departments, states that I'm talking about. But you need a leader right there in the middle to bring all of you together and he will do and he will behave and act as the leader to bring the best out of everyone and to produce the best music to showcase to the world. So please, if you have time, read the book about Roger Nuremberg and the concept of Maestro and how we can use this concept to make Wogos work. The challenges I've mentioned today is very real. We must understand it, number one. Number two, if we don't know what we understand, but we don't know where we are and where we need to go, the first thing that we need to do is to audit our organization, to see where the gaps are, where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. Those weaknesses is something that we need to put into a plan of action to make sure we reach the standard of where we want to be. We have the strength and we have the weakness. We do the audit first. Once we have done our audit to make Wogos work, then we need to now prioritize which among the stress that we among the, the the strength that we need to choose to put all our effort in. Once we have identified our priorities, next is always to execute. And to execute is something that we need to plan. And planning in Wogos is just not having our own plan, but a plan that is shared among the community or among government as a whole. And of course, sometimes we have our weaknesses and other ministries, they have their strength. And we can, when we combine our resources together, we optimize them and definitely WOGOS will work. Today in Malaysia, we face climate change. We face issues on, on achieving our targets in the SDG goals. 
we have our uh, zero carbon goals and we have our health goals we have our military goals but without combining together our our resources we will never optimize and we'll always be at the losing end and losing end ladies and gentlemen is where we are moving towards to now look at our competitors namely vietnam indonesia thailand it used to be we were the leaders we were far ahead of them but today we do not need to look far we just look over the shoulder they are very close to us so what is happening to us are we losing our competitiveness edge are we becoming incompetent so that's why we need to now look at where we are do our stock take our audit we prioritize where our priorities are we know our strength our weaknesses work on the weaknesses plan out our plan share our plan among uh, the rest of us and then tap onto each other's resources so that we can optimize them and reach the goal of Ogos. So my challenge today in the Ministry of Defense is to now to bring the military uh, track and the civilian track together. This is the most difficult ministry in my five ministries that I have uh, become SecGen because of the two track uh, uh behavior in 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 mindef i have my civilian track and i have my atn track very challenging and different uh form of people civilian you know civilian will always be civilian but military they have their proud their pride they have their strength of course they have their allegiance to the country loyalty so that's a very strong strength which i need to now balance and that's the one topic that we are talking about today harmonizing the balance uh, of national national security with Vogos. So maybe I do, I do not need to speak too much today, but I think those messages today that I've shared with you are reality checks for us to see where we are today, what we need to evaluate ourselves and where we need to go. I know I have, they've prepared my, my speech here today, <laughs> but you know, having, in, having spent 30 years in the economics sector to come today and speak about security to all experts on security is something of a big challenge for me but today i presented to you number one a commonality among us which is every one of us has the security agenda but maybe a different type of security we bring those together as one common uh, uh, distinction among us that we can bring our thoughts together secondly use this discussion today to now find on how best that we can project the WOGOS approach that the MINDEF has already put in their plan and many of our ministries have also put in our plan to make sure that now we can uh, rethink on our resources and optimize them to reach the WOGOS goal that we have been talking about and striving. Today we have our distinguished panelists, which I hope try to challenge them on the questions that you have on how we can make this work. If we do not make this work, as I mentioned to you, we will continue to be on the losing end. We will lose our competitiveness. We will lose our leadership. We will lose our voice in the bilateral forum, in the multilateral forum, in the regional forum, and more importantly, in the global forum. We will not have our voice heard because we are not united. We are not harmonized and we do not optimize our resources. People will look at us and belittle us forever. So that's why we need to stand up today, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about this one approach, which I think is the one strategy which I think will make Malaysia to be competitive again and to bring us all together united under one leader. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I wish you the best in your discussion today. And I hope the results of the discussion today, we can put into a plan and present to the highest authority in the government for us to now look and use it in our way forward. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Yabal Gadatuk Sri, for your enlightening keynote address. Before we end, as a token of appreciation, I would like to invite Yabal Bahagia, Major General Datuk Haji Muhammad Nizam bin Haji Jaafar, Commandant, National Resilience College, present the mentor to Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Sri Isham bin Ishaq, 
Secretary General of Ministry of Defense. Next, I would like to cordially invite Yang Berhormat Datuk Seri Haji Noizan bin Khazali, State Secretary of Kedah, to present the memento as a token of appreciation on behalf of KCS. Thank you, Yang Bagi Dato. With that, we have come to the conclusion of the session. Before we start our next session, we will have 10 minute breaks and start our seminar at 10.30. Thank you. Yang Bagi Tan Sri, Dato Sri, Dato Sri, Dato Dato, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we are come to the highlight of, the, of our event. We are honored to have three expert panelists, Yang Bagi Tan Sri Abdul Wahid bin Anwar, Chairman Busa Malaysia Berhad Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Mawad Faiz Abdullah Chairman Institute of Strategic and International Studies and Yang berbahagia Datuk Dr. Shazalina Zainul Abidin Under Secretary South and Central Asia Division Ministry of Foreign Affairs Before I hand the stage over to the moderator Allow me to briefly introduce the moderator for today Professor Ruhanas Harun Professor Rana Sarun is professor at the National Defense University of Malaysia. She, gradua she graduated in international relations from the Inter University of Malaya, the University of Sorbonne, Paris, and the Inter Institute of Political Studies, Paris. She has taught extensively in Malaysia and abroad and has contributed widely to academic and popular writings, including newspapers and at international fora. I now invite the moderator and the panelists to the stage. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, yeah, uh, rendahkan sedikit. Thank you. Um, uh, yang berbahagia, uh, Datuk Sabri bin Zali, Presiden Puspahanas. Yang berbahagia, Major General Datuk Nizam, Komandan National Resilience College. Distinguished panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, selamat pagi dan selamat datang ke seminar bertajuk Malaysia's Whole of Government and Whole of Society Approach Towards National Security. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by giving just a brief introduction to the topic or to the theme of the seminar. At NRC, the term whole of government and whole of society is affectionately uh, known as WOGOS. At first, I thought it sounds funny, but now after 
what the KSU has meant, it sounds quite sweet. So I think uh, now we use the word, uh, the term uh, Wogos. Uh, it is an approach which has been devised by the Malaysian government as a strategy to secure and, and enhance our national security and ultimately our national interest. Uh, national security, as we are all aware, is broadly defined to include not only the physical aspect of security, but also the non-physical or non-tangible aspects. National security involves protection of the core values of a nation, including national independence, territorial integrity and sovereignty, physical uh, security of the population and their welfare, uh, national unity and uh, economic well-being of the nation. In the Malaysian context, national security include all that I have uh, mentioned, and more often than not, national security is discussed in relation to the kind of threats faced by the country, both domestic and external. And threats can be traditional or non-traditional. The country has faced some of these threats and challenges to its national security. And it must be said that I think uh, we have, to a large extent, succeeded in overcoming uh, these uh, challenges. But national security or insecurity is not static. With uh, the elements shaping uh, that security evolve so do strategies and approaches to deal with national security issues and problem. Uh, this is one way of responding to what uh, uh, has been mentioned just now that uh, we are a bit late in proposing this. Other countries, uh, even Japan, has done it many years ago. So this is part of that evolving uh, geopolitics and uh, elements. So to manage uh, threats and vulnerabilities to national security, the government has developed an approach, or I would call it a strategy, and that is uh, WOGOS. Uh, what does it exactly mean? What does it refer to? And how it will be implemented um, will be of interest to policymakers, analysts, and of course, the public uh, at large. I think that is our ultimate or final uh, destination actually. So ladies and gentlemen, to deal with these important issues, we have three very distinguished uh, speakers and allow me to introduce uh, them to you uh, one uh, by one. Our first speaker uh, will be uh, Yang Berbahagia Professor Dr. Muhammad Faiz Abdullah, Chairman of ISIS Malaysia, a lawyer by training, Professor Faiz graduated from UIA, University of Malaya, and then went on to obtain his MBA from Australia and a PhD from UPM. Professor Faiz wears many hats and ex has extensive experience in public policy, in research, corporate sector. He has been a journalist, a writer, and scholar. And very important, in 2009, Professor Faiz, together with Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, co-founded the World Forum for Muslim Democrats, uh, dedicated to providing a common platform for public intellectuals to articulate their views on Islam, on reform, on democracy, and governance. Professor, thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to be here. Our second panelist is Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, Chairman of Bursa Malaysia Berhad, a chartered accountant uh, by training. Tan Sri is one of the most accomplished corporate leaders in Malaysia, having led as CEO uh, of major organizations such as UEM Group, Telecom Malaysia, Maybank, and PNB. He currently serves as chairman of WWF Malaysia. This is not the fighting club. Huh? <laughs> uh, professor of practice at the INSAFE University 
and the Sultan bin uh, Abdul Aziz, Sultan bin Abdul Aziz visiting fellow at Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, United Kingdom. Thank you, Tansri. Our third and last speaker, but not least, uh, is Ambassador Dato Dr. Shazlina Zainul Abidin. Dato Shazlina received her tertiary education in the United Kingdom, all of it, uh, namely at London University, and then a master's degree from Edinburgh University, and a PhD from Sheffield University, all in the UK. Huh, um, a career diplomat, Dato Shazlina has served as permanent at the permanent mission of Malaysia in New York, as ambassador in Senegal with concurrent accreditation to Mali, Burkina Faso, Cap Verde, and the Gambia. She was until very recently the director general of IDFR. Now she's back at Wisma Putra as the Under Secretary for South Asia and the Central Asian uh, Republics. Before I pass on um, the mic to our speakers, may I remind them that each speaker has 30 minutes maximum to present his or her views. Uh, it can be less, up to you, but not more. Yeah? So, without further ado, may I now invite our first speaker, Professor Dr. Faiz. Prof, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Prof, yeah, for that very uh, rose-tinted introduction, which I profoundly appreciate. If you allow me, I will get straight to the point. But before that, maybe some salutations are in order. Some of those who were here earlier have left. So I've got to check the field first, you know. I'm speaking to, I hope, quite a bunch of military officers. I won't go into the killing zone yet, you know, but uh, we'll just see how the terrain goes. I first believe that uh, it will be Yambubagia Vice Admiral, that was Sabri. Uh, Yambubagia Major General, that was Nizam. And uh, colleagues, and most important, ladies and gentlemen, officers, and I believe uh, we have quite a huge bunch coming in from the virtual world, as well as from the ECADA civil service. I have prepared, uh, in all frankness, 17 pages. You know, once you're a lecturer, you tend to think that everybody needs a lecture. But I have, I have had my first talk here before, a couple of months ago, and I know what the psyche is like. So I won't be just reading from here, but I can uh, assure Prof Moderator that it would definitely fall within the timeline of 30. In fact, my, the last time is usually around 20. But do give me a knock, you think, if I'm speaking too much, you know. So let me begin by first saying that first off, um, my profound gratitude to the National Resilience College for allowing me another opportunity to speak at one of your many, many insightful events and to hear from my fellow panelists as well today. My task today is to speak about the government's perspective on the problem statement. But before I go any further, perhaps a, a slight caveat is in order. I just want to say that as a, an autonomous organization, ISIS, that is ISIS Malaysia, not, yeah, this is the original ISIS. Now, the role of this institute is to provide a, as it were, second opinion on policy issues to the prime minister and to the cabinet. So our quote unquote area of operations is primarily in track to diplomacy, informal, unofficial, and thoroughly, as you would know, unglamorous. But having said that, we do answer the call of duty 
for track 1.5 diplomacy as well as and when we are called to do so or as and when we assess that the situation warrants it accordingly what i'm about to present is essentially an attempt i won't go to the point of using the word advice as an attempt at deciphering the government's approach rather than a definitive statement about it but more than that i hope that I will be able to share an appraisal of our approach and some modest suggestions, very modest, on how we can move forward. So in the course of doing so, I might sound a little cynical, but it's all done in good faith and with the view of trying to see how we can move ahead. Maybe a little bit of sarcasm here and there, but I think uh, if my last talk here was of any use, at the end of the day, I'm working and have been said to be essentially very pro MINDEF. Yeah, so we don't have to worry too much about that part. So the question is, how can we work more effectively across governments and society to harness our national power for national security aims? Let's, let's start with the big question. So allow me to begin with a rather trite observation that a whole of government and a whole of society approach was what we witnessed in different shapes and forms. I'm going empirically now, not theoretically. The, theoretically, the theoretical definitions have been given and very good comprehensive ones as well. So I will skip that and go to straight what we have recently gone through the trials and tribulations of our COVID-19. Yep, this was a pandemic and effective responses to the pandemic required an alignment of interests, effort and resources across multiple government agencies, including, and I must emphasize here, the security forces. But it also called for the active cooperation of the public, whether it was to observe quarantine requirements wear masks, undergo vaccinations, or simply a question of washing your hands. No amount of coercion, no amount of duress, no amount of incentives would have been sufficient if society at large had not been persuaded that they had to be a part of the solution. I think we all recall what it's like, the so-called developed or more advanced democracies when this was happening in, during the pandemic, protests, demonstrations, riots, just because they were asked to wear masks. That is a classic failure of the lack of a whole of society together with the whole of government. So even so, one could argue that the need for cohesion in governance and indeed in addressing security, this challenges, this has long been recognized. They may not have been spoken, they may not have been written, but practically, if you look at the empirical evidence, this has been a factor which has been totally recognized. We may not have used the same words, but I'll go a little bit down there. The ancient Greeks, the Romans clearly understood that wars were not only fought and won on the battlefield. Take for example, Every soldier, uh, I think we are pretty familiar with the favorite Greek historian, the 5th BC, Thucydides is the name. Now, of course, students of uh, geopolitics, students of uh, military history will remember his famous idea, and I would like to quote, right as the world goes is only in question between equals in power. While the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, unquote. Very, very grandiloquent. A lot in that just short sentence. That is, of course, from the history of the Peloponnesian War. But for our present purposes this morning, the following quote of Thucydides is more in point. The society that separates the scholars from his warriors will have his thinking done by cowards and his fighting by fools. 
or listen to Cicero, the first century BC Roman statesman who wrote in his Philippics, and I quote, these are very, very crucial. What a simple line it is. He says that sinews of war are infinite money, unquote. Uh, just for context for those, again, keen on military war, keen on war history, who want to update themselves and look at perspective in the long run, the Philippics is, of course, is a compilation of speeches written by Cicero to condemn Mark Antony. Of course, Mark Antony is a great ally of Julius Caesar, and he was assassinated by the conspirators. So that particular compilation of speeches was meant to go after him. Now, Cicero was a, a great orator. In fact, some historians say that he was the greatest orator of the uh, legendary history in terms of the Roman Empire. He won the Senate over to get the Senate to declare Mark Antony as the enemy of the state. And what's the point? And because of that, the Senate gave sanction for the orders of the army to pursue him. Find and destroy. That was what it was. Of course, the orders are good. The delivery could be something else. So when the army finally went to war and they could found them out, it was Mark Antony and his co-ally Octavia, who became Octavius Caesar later, they got them killed. The army was captured and became under the control of Mark Antony instead. This is a classic case of showing how theory is good, bravado is good. When push comes to shove, it is said that the proof of the pudding is, of course, in the eating. So now coming back to the significance of the course, they suggest a more than keen awareness that you can't, I repeat, you can't, you can't achieve victory unless you can exploit the various levers of your national power. In Thucydides' case, he referred to what we today would call policy making, intellectual, and perhaps even media elites, I think we have a uh, a great guest here representing the media. So maybe the whole of society concept is not new after all. People say that it goes back perhaps to the 1980s. Here you have a case. It goes back as long as civilization existed. Perhaps different names were used. It won't be necessary by an extended retelling of the history of this country, for example, whether under British or subsequently as an independent nation, that we fought the emergency and subsequent security contingencies. The, those were nothing short of whole of government and whole of society approaches on a monumental scale. But if you recall, those terms were not used yet. Here, it bears repeating the words of the great philosophical poet, T.S. Eliot. History may be servitude, but history maybe freedom. So hence, the past is a relentless companion to every nation. And no matter how fast it marches forward, it cannot shake off the memories of where it has been. In this regard, look no further than Almahum Tun Abdul Razak's approach of keselamatan dan pembangunan, or defense and development, otherwise known as Kesban. Now, this was part of the counterinsurgency initiative advocated by Robert Thompson that the plan should not be merely limited to military operations and security instead. Instead, you must have the approach which was to include political, social, economic, administrative, policing, and other measures. And of course, the whole of society. Following the dissolution of the National Operation Council, of course, that is the Majlis. Uh, Gerakan Negara. In 1971, the government established the NSC, the National Security Council. We were having a nice chat just now earlier during the break on the NSC. A couple of things, yeah, that are a bit sensitive, but I would just basically gloss over and skip some of those parts. As you know, in 1971, the, the, the NSC was established, but the form, the function, the formality, the powers were eventually formalized and very belatedly by the National Security Council Act of 2016. 
So I think this itself could be a subject for another PhD project. Yeah. Mention should also be made of the concept of total defense. Pertahanan menyeluruh, hanro. Introduced in 1986. Clearly, the ethos. This is a holistic, all-encompassing approach to security governance and society. Has long resonated in this country with echoes extending back through our history. Now, if the need for a Wogos, I have it all in full, so I've decided since that, you know, this particular, I had the same temperament when this term was used. Wogos is like, oh, whoa, you know, and that is this dangerous thing of being considered, you know, now this big movement on the left, the left woke, you know, yeah, associated with all kinds of other things we don't want to be associated with. But okay, since it's now been given a formal sanction, I will use the term Wogos. Now, this approach has long been embedded in the country. How? Being embedded is one thing. How do we actually implement it? To answer that, we first need to clarify what the concept is, or rather, what the concept is not. Sometimes the negatives will give us the positives. Now, let us be clear about it. The Wogos approach does not literally presuppose a unity of effort across all government departments and the whole of society. I am not uh, here taking a different position from what has been said by the KSU just now this morning, which was very illustrative. Many points were enlightening, but I'm just going into the granular parts to make sure that we don't get befuddled when major statements are made. What I'm saying here is that it does not mean that every government office in this land and every Malaysian will be like a colony of ants acting in perfect unison, always willing to sacrifice the few for the sake of the whole, all serving a single specific aim. If that is the case, it will be the Orwellian 1984 scenario. We don't want that. That is because to expect such a high degree of cohesion and unity of effort is neither practical nor even desirable. It is not practical because there will always be such a thing as a varying institutional interest. Varying institutional interest, not necessarily disruptive institutional interest. This is where the government will have to take criticism and not consider any or every dissenting opinion as being in opposition or carrying a sinister move to undermine it. Because Malaysia is still a democracy and a federation of states. Different states have different approaches. But a certain level of dissension and discord is inevitable. And I would say even healthy for our society, for the nation. We should not expect much less demand that the people are always supportive and moving in lockstep with every move that the government makes, even when it concerns issues of utmost importance, even as national security. Touching on very sensitive issues now. Indeed, any government structure that tries to achieve such cohesion at the societal level should and would necessarily be a dictatorial one. That aim can only belong to Malaysia's past and inshallah, it will not be in the present nor in the future. Having said that, this is not to say that we should come to accept a government and society in disarray, in discord, in chaos. No. For example, we should all wish and hope that our government agencies would work in close coordination with one another. A good intra-agency process, especially involving those critical organs of state. And here, I would completely agree with the Dato Sri KSU, yep. such as the NSC, Treasury, MINDEF, of course, Home Affairs, MITI, and of course, Wisma Putra. This is vital for our national security. But a certain degree of misalignment in their approaches is inevitable. And that is not necessarily a bad thing because officials in these ministries will invariably be exposed to different situations, different scenarios, different circumstances, and of course, differences in experiences. 
Indeed, attempts must be made to consider and reconcile the differences of their various ministries. But we should not allow attempts at building consensus to lead to paralysis. Or even worse, suboptimal policies, resulting from selecting the lowest common denominator. Wisma Putra, for instance, may object to Miti's recommendation for Malaysia to participate in an economic partnership agreement with a particular country or a particular group of countries. Home affairs, perhaps I'm talking about maybe Bukit Aman special branch, may advise uh, ISIS Malaysia, for example, to exercise greater circumspection in its dealings or engagement with certain foreign parties. No need to uh, specify details of which country, but I believe you can put uh, two and two together. So, but there often comes a point where a decision needs to be made. And one ministry or the other, one important agency or the other, needs to make a policy call. And that calls for courage of conviction. Not just playing to the gallery. Not just to get a standing ovation. So, what do we mean by whole of government and whole of society if we do not mean what the words simply say? I would venture to suggest that there should be three elements here. And I'm just giving suggestions. Q&A, you could question me. You could have a debate on that. But it's not written in stone. These are just suggestions. Number one, engage collaboration. The key word is on engage. Engage means two-way street, not a one-way street. Number two, integrated coordination. That means looking at the big picture, making sure that yours is not against the other or the other doesn't go along with yours. And of course, this one and two will lead to what we call concerted output or concerted action. Now, these two elements are particularly relevant for the Wagos because they form the center pillar. The third and final element, I would particularly refer to whole of society pillar as well. Let me briefly explain. Am I still in the time, Pro? Okay, good. A few more minutes. Oh my God, I got skip. Yes. I think I'll just get on. To, I've just hardly got 10 pages halfway through. Thank you. You have to give me a tinker first. Uh, uh, Five minutes more. Oh my God, I, I thought I got 15 minutes more. Okay, good. In that case, all right then, let me go to the, well, it's not a killing zone, but uh, let's see where we are here. Yeah. I will briefly discuss national power and national security. Both are, I begin with the word amorphous concepts. Anybody who claims that they are able to actually come down to a very definitive description of these terms could probably be indulging in, you know, self-deception. Yeah? As we say, this can be debated to no end. Probably until the sun burns out. Now, as much as I appreciate your company here, my company here, I think... I do intend to leave this place at some stage, yes. So I won't go into that. But I'd like to make the point that Malaysia has vast reserves of national power that we can better articulate to the rest of the world. Indeed, that is what Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim has consistently been saying and doing when he travels abroad. A key message he has for his foreign interlocutors is Malaysia's centrality in the global high-tech economy. For instance, Malaysia accounts for 25% of America's semiconductor demand. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the production of America's best-selling pickup truck, the Ford F-150, came to an abrupt halt. Why? Because Malaysia was under the MCO. That was because most of the chips on those trucks were made in Malaysia. Another example is that over 50% of the composite wing parts for Boeing 737 and the Airbus A320 planes are made in Malaysia. 
We are also a major link in the global supply chain for the medical devices industry. If you have used hearing implants, orthopedic products, pacemakers, hard valves, chances are they were made in Malaysia. It's a long list. It's not meant to be exhaustive. But the point is, if Malaysia shuts down, Detroit will have to shut down. If Malaysia shuts down Toulouse, Ranton, where Airbus and Boeing make the final assemblies of those aeroplanes, will also have to shut down. Malaysia is therefore a vital node in the global supply chain for critical technologies. I think it's high time we take a back seat and count our blessings in some of these. And that is a major source of national power. Soft power. We have, and it should not be underestimated. As a country, and despite some of our domestic problems, we have a lot of them, many countries continue to see Malaysia as a successful model. Our multiracial society and democracy serve as examples. It's not perfect, but it is there. For other developing nations seeking to find a balance between economic growth social harmony and political freedom. Malaysia's reputation as a moderate Islamic nation also garners respect as we have shown it is possible to be both modern and Muslim at the same time. While we still have work to do, Malaysia's soft power gives us influence and allows us a punch above our weight on the global stage. But while there is no doubt that we are strategically, economically, and reputationally well positioned, we need to invest in some of the other levers of national power. I'm coming to the end. I think Dr. Nizam is looking very, like, nervously. Now, this is the part. This is the part I'm coming to none other than the guns and butter discourse. I will forget about the butter. Yeah, we don't have time for that. We talk about just homing on the government allocation for defense spending to bolster our military power, which has a direct bearing on national security. Of okay, course, the, the latest budget is 10% from the last one. Now, this country has been under-investing in the armed forces for at least 20 years, maybe 25, maybe 30, I won't quibble. Keeping our defense budget at or below 1% of GDP has taken a tremendous toll on our armed forces. In recent years, the Philippines has pushed their spending up to about 1.5%. Singapore and Thailand's defense expenditures have hovered around 3% and 1.5% of their GDPs for some time. Indonesia's spending as a percentage of economic output is like ours, just below, slightly below 1%. But remember, their GDP is three times, at least, larger than ours. So you have to look at the absolute numbers as well, I'm sure. Military officers will agree. Per capita is one thing, but absolute numbers is another. It is not a great exaggeration to say that such low spending levels have in part led to a hollowing out of the Royal Malaysian Navy. I was just having a small chat, I think. I don't know, you would agree with me? Yes. Some civilian elites, and I don't mean here civil service, I'm talking about the general view, may think that defense spending is a luxury. They are completely wrong. This is a misconception which must be changed. As the famous Latin proverb says, civis pacem para bellum. That was written by Flavius Vegetus Renatus 1,800 years ago. Now, relatively more recent times, 18th century, you have Karl von Clausewitz. He said more or less the same thing. That is, to secure peace is to prepare for war. Now, his tenets are that a strong military deterrent is the best way to prevent war and in order to defend its sovereignty, in order to defend and protect its citizens, a nation must always be prepared to go to war. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a warmonger. Yeah, but facts are facts. Let's face it, without an independent capability to resist coercion from potential adversaries, the other levers of national power, 
talent, soft power, industry, resources, or even diplomatic relationships will be exposed to unacceptable risks. Therefore, even as we talk about responding to national security challenges through WAGOS, let us keep sight of the fact that, quote unquote, a robust and ready armed forces is the bedrock of those events. To convince, I'm coming to my end, to convince his comrades to take on Mark Antony and Octavian at the Battle of Philippi. Brutus says, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood, leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyage of their lives, is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or forever lose our ventures. I believe the time is now. We have to take the current when it serves, and we must seize the day, carpe diem. Investing in defense is imperative for safeguarding national sovereignty and interests, while non-military means are crucial. They can only be effective if backed by credible deterrence capabilities. We must bring this point across and airline our perceptions before gaps emerge in our ability to secure the wider instruments of statecraft and progress. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Prof. Hanas. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera uh, yang saya hormati uh, uh, Laksmana Datuk Sabri, uh, Datuk Nizam, um, Datuk Sri Haji Nurizan, uh, SS um, Bersan uh, Pengurusan uh, NLC uh, dan juga UPNM uh, serta Bersan Kedah Civil Service uh, tuan-tuan perempuan yang saya hormati sekalian. Um, let me begin by thanking um, NRC and UPNM for inviting me to be here. When I got the call from Major General uh, Rahim Yusuf a month ago, uh, I was actually uh, in the UK. And um, it's always very difficult to say no uh, to uh, Major General Rahim uh, to actually come here. Uh, so indeed, I'm very happy that I'm able to uh, sort out my schedule and be uh, able to actually interact and engage with you uh, this morning. If I may have um, a clicker, please, uh, for my slides, which I hope it's been uploaded. Uh, if there's a clicker, that would be great that I can um, move. So uh, if I may just continue while we, we get the, the, uh, the clicker. So what um, I plan to do uh, this morning uh, is perhaps to touch a little bit about uh, the national security uh, policy and how that's applicable to the corporate sector, how it is aligned to uh, the Madani economic framework, and uh, thereafter to uh, talk about the PLC transformation program uh, that uh, we at uh, Bruce Amisha uh, put in place that has got some relevance to uh, national security and nation, and nation building and thereafter some broad comments uh, about how 
I think Malaysia should uh, move forward uh, in dealing with this issue. Now, let me talk about uh, the uh, national security uh, policy. This is a policy document and that was uh, issued, I believe, in 2021, and it covers the period 2021 to 2025. Uh, and it is under the uh, National Security uh, Council, uh, Majlis Keselamatan Negara. And uh, as I understand it, this should be the reference document uh, for every single Malaysian. But I believe, however, that um, it may not be that obvious uh, to many people. Now, obviously, um, this document defines national security to mean being free uh, from any threat, whether internally or externally, to the core values uh, that we have. Now, over the years, we've had many incidences um, that threaten our national security uh, from the past uh, pre-independence when we were colonized by not just the, the uh, Portuguese, the Dutch and the British, uh, but also the Japanese, to the communist insurgency that we had, uh, not just once, but twice, first during the period uh, 1948 uh, to 1960, and uh, thereafter, uh, the Rurat Kedua, uh, from 1968 uh, until 1989, uh, until uh, that uh, accord was actually uh, finally signed. And uh, thereafter, after we gained our independence, uh, in 1957, uh, if you remember, we had that um, confrontasi, uh, the Indonesian conf confrontation back in 1963, um, 1969 ethnic conflict, and of course uh, the 2013 uh, Sulu uh, incursion uh, into Sabah. Um, and thereafter, there were many alleged uh, attempts to overthrow the government uh, through undemocratic means, um, some uh, through arms conflict, and, and so on. Although some of them may be small, uh, but uh, if they're not uh, nipped in the bud uh, early, so that can threaten uh, national security. And of course, there are also other allegations um, of uh, external interference uh, in our uh, domestic uh, policies. So uh, it is indeed uh, good that we have um, this um, uh, policy, uh, which is the overarching policy for comprehensive uh, national security aimed at uh, maintaining, safeguarding and defending the national core values. Now, ensuring Malaysia is safe from physical and non-physical threats uh, that may influence corrupt people's minds, and uh, ensuring the survival of uh, Malaysia as an independent, peaceful, uh, safe, and sovereign nation. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the threats would include um, interference by foreign powers uh, in the administration and internal affairs of our country. Um, if I may uh, request to move to slide three, please, which is um, the 13 threats identified by the uh, national uh, security policy. Now, the next one, please. Um, this is in respect of uh, fragility of national unity, uh, challenges facing the nation's democratic system, uh, and it also covered the um, cybersecurity, disasters, crisis, um, the pandemic, uh, which um, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Faiz uh, spoke about uh, the energy uh, security, food security, and uh, proliferation of uh, nuclear arms and uh, arms development programs. Now, um, so the idea is actually uh, we know, we must know what are the threats um, and uh, what are the core values that we're talking about. So in the document, we, uh, the council uh, identified, thank you, um, uh, nine, um, uh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, identified um, nine core values uh, that we need uh, to maintain, to preserve, uh, and uh, to strengthen uh, to ensure the survival uh, of Malaysia as an independent, peaceful, and sovereign nation. So among others, it talks about the territorial sovereignty and integrity, uh, social political stability, national unity, good governance, economic integrity, uh, social justice, uh, sustainable development, people security, and uh, international uh, recognition. Uh, the good thing is that um, the national security policy identified uh, some 20 key strategies uh, to preserve those uh, core values. 
Now, um, I'm not going to go through uh, all the 20 of them, but I think um, suffice to say that um, it will require a whole of government, whole of society approach uh, needed uh, to ensure uh, its uh, success. Uh, now, this is essential to, uh, to get the commitment, support and cooperation of uh, every uh, single federal uh, ministries, um, state governments, uh, department and agencies, uh, the private sector, NGO and the people. And it must be adhered to you know, when uh, formulating, coordinating and implementing national policies uh, which are directly, or directly related uh, to uh, national security. So I'm happy uh, that um, you know, we do have uh, some coordination uh, between the various ministries, but as Dr. Sri Isha mentioned, uh, it could be better. Now, just to be clear, when he spoke about um, the silo mentality um, in government, uh, it doesn't happen uh, only in government, it does happen in the private sector too. Uh, in um, large corporates, uh, including when I was at Maybank, for example, or uh, Telecom Malaysia or UM Group. So it does happen. So I think the idea would be for us to make sure that all of us um, are aware, are committed to the uh, vision and mission of our organization and then work together towards uh, achieving uh, those aspirations, if I may. Now, within the context of corporate Malaysia, um, out of the 20 uh, strategies uh, identified under the policy document, uh, I would say there are six um, that were or they are related uh, to the uh, corporate sector. Uh, firstly, to talk about bridging the socioeconomic gap, uh, where we talk about the need to increase uh, job opportunities for uh, citizens, to improve income equality uh, among the communities and transform rural areas uh, so as to rise the people's well-being. So that's where the corporate sector has got that responsibility to create um, jobs and business opportunities. Uh, secondly, in terms of cultivating economic resilience, uh, the need to strengthen national economic fundamentals to face a global economic uh, competition and to maintain uh, the legitimacy of the government to manage uh, the country. And that also includes uh, the need for government to also protect um, the uh, investments of uh, Malaysian corporates uh, abroad. Uh, so I think uh, as part of um, our uh, uh, objective uh, to preserve our economic resilience, uh, it is important for some of our businesses, not just to focus on business here in Malaysia, but to expand uh, into the region uh, as well. Uh, third, in terms of the need to integrate values of integrity uh, to fight corruption, irregularity and abuse of power at all levels, uh, both in the public and the private sector, through legal, regulatory and policy provisions uh, you remember that um, the MACC Act uh, was uh, strengthened a few years ago, um, three years ago, um, to include the Section 17A, uh, which um, put the, the responsibility of any corrupt practices onto the board and management of uh, companies. So in the past, uh, when one of the staff um, you know, engaged in the practice of bribing uh, an official to get contracts. For example, the company can say, oh, sorry, I don't know about it. It's actually uh, my marketing staff who did that. Uh, but um, in today's environment, uh, under the MECC uh, Act, um, Section 17A, there is that corporate responsibility. So any of the staff uh, who committed any acts of uh, bribery, um, the CEO, the board members, uh, management members will be accountable and uh, can go to jail. Um, uh, the fourth is in terms of uh, implementing sustainable uh, development. Um, so I think it's important uh, for us to grow uh, the economy, uh, to develop the country uh, with due regard uh, to the uh, environment and to do so in a sustainable manner. I'll come back uh, to that a bit later. Number five is about the need to manage uh, natural resources efficiently. Um, and uh, this uh, covers uh, not just uh, your typical um, oil and gas, uh, but uh, in terms of other resources, of uh, uh, food um, and uh, water uh, in particular. Uh, and number six is about the need to improve uh, the people's well-being. So at the end of the day, um, as country progresses, it's important uh, for us to improve 
uh, the well-being uh, of uh, the people, uh, if I may. Now, all this uh, I actually very much align to the uh, Madani economic framework. Now, I must say that when the Prime Minister um, launched this economic framework uh, in August, um, it provided that clarity uh, in terms of the problems that we are facing uh, and um, where we want to take the, the, the country to. Uh, and the good thing is actually this framework was subsequently followed very closely by the uh, National Energy uh, Transition Roadmap um, and then by the new Industrial Master Plan um, and subsequently uh, by um, uh, the review of the uh, 12th uh, Malaysia Plan. Now, um, just to be clear, uh, in this uh, Madani economic framework, um, there are some We talk about our GDP today, uh, the size is about 1.8 trillion ringgit uh, in current uh, nominal terms. Uh, now, the, um, we can then look at um, how uh, is contributed um, uh, in terms of returns to the capital providers and how uh, is uh, also uh, contributed um, to uh, income for the people. So there is a measurement that we uh, call the wages to GDP ratio. Uh, back in 2009, uh, for example, um, we had a, a number which is more like 28-29%. Uh, and over the years, uh, we were able to increase it to 37% uh, as of 2017. Well, but since then, it has dropped down to 32.4%, uh, uh, which is about the level today. Now, what that means is that uh, we're not sharing the economic cake equitably uh, between the capital providers and the uh, labor providers. Um, and because of that, it is actually reflected in the low income level of our people. Now, it is shocking uh, to me uh, that uh, half of the population, half of the workers in Malaysia earn 2,250 ringgit and less back in 2021. So today, the figure I believe is about 2,500 ringgit. But it's actually it's crazy. Uh, imagine, out of our labor force of uh, 16 million people, half of them actually earn below 2,500 ringgit today. Uh, so really, uh, something is actually not right, um, and it needs uh, to be fixed. Uh, especially when this country of ours has been growing by an average of 4.7 percent per annum in terms of economic growth. Um, so I think uh, we really need to address this issue. Uh, among others, uh, we need to uh, look at our foreign labor policy. Again, it's crazy that we have 3 million uh, foreign workers, uh, yet our income level of people is low. So I always believe uh, that if you uh, can um, come up with uh, a wage uh, or labor policy, uh, which is conducive, where you pay people fairly, uh, you improve productivity, create more heavily jobs, you will end up with a situation whereby there's enough Malaysians wanting to do the job and being paid uh, fairly. And therefore, the over-dependence on foreign workers can be reduced significantly. So I'm hopeful uh, that um, what's been spoken about uh, in terms of the need uh, to address this issue 
including reviewing our minimum wage policy and uh, coming up with uh, the proposed uh, progressive wage policy um, coupled with uh, some tweaking in incentives to encourage greater automation uh, will result in improvement in the income uh, of the people. Um, so the third the area which I thought I would highlight um, in terms of the problem statement would be uh, in terms of um, where we are, uh, in terms of investments and our competitive uh, age. So uh, I mentioned that the, in terms of uh, GDP growth, yes, over the years, 4.7% uh, per annum uh, GDP growth, uh, which is actually quite respectable given the fact that uh, that is after taking into account the global financial crisis and other turbulence uh, along the way. But uh, in terms of um, our relative competitiveness, compared to other countries, um, we uh, are slipping down. So for example, uh, in terms of the um, IMD, uh, World Competitiveness uh, Ranking, uh, we've seen the, our ranking drop from number 14 uh, back in 1997 uh, to number 27 um, uh, uh, this year. So I think that's something which uh, needed to be addressed. So in terms of clarity of targets, so uh, I think um, uh, there are there are twin objectives. Uh, one is about raising the ceiling, um, and the other one is about raising the floor too. Uh, raising the ceiling, referring to uh, among others, uh, undertaking measures uh, to propel Malaysia to be a leading economy in, in uh, ASEAN uh, and Asia uh, in particular. And uh, raising the floor means that uh, we need um, to do what we can to improve the quality uh, and um, and of um, and life uh, of our uh, people basically and that um, includes uh, improving the income level um, and making sure uh, that uh, people have got uh, decent jobs um, and uh, decent standard of living so in terms of the target that you look at the, on the right hand side here uh, these are you know, i would say very bold targets uh, they're not easy to be achieved but they can be achieved only if the whole of government, the whole of society, including corporates, uh, were to take action uh, and uh, to execute the various uh, plans uh, that have been uh, outlined. So for us, for example, to be among the top 30 largest economy uh, in the world, um, we are currently at number 36. To move down to top 30, we have to outrun, outgrow all the other countries ahead of us. Uh, so that means that we need to grow in real terms by between 5.5% to 6% GDP. So this year, uh, 2023, um, our growth rate is 4%. Um, next year, the uh, target um, uh, is between 4 to 5%. So we are still well below the long-term target to achieve uh, that the top 30 largest economy. But that's something which we need to do. Um, so this year and next year, preparing the ground, uh, fix our structural issues that we need uh, so that uh, from 2025 uh, onwards, uh, we'll be able to achieve that 6% uh, level uh, onwards. Sorry. Um, sorry? Five minutes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I thought the, um, I have more than that. So uh, in terms of um, um, linking it back to corporate performance, so three years ago, uh, we convened uh, a workshop among the top 50 leaders in corporate Malaysia, covering institutional investors, fund managers, uh, regulators, uh, CEOs of corporate Malaysia, and uh, partners of managing firms. And we identified, among others, the need for public companies uh, to improve their performance. And um, so last year, uh, we came up with the five guide books uh, to assist them in this journey. Uh, Gap book number one is in terms of creating purpose and performance driven PLCs. Number two is about uh, sustainability and being socially responsible and ethical. Uh, number three is about needing to strengthen stakeholder management and investor relation. Uh, number four is about digital enablement. And number five, which is relevant for today's conversation, is about uh, contributing uh, towards uh, nation building. Now, uh, this guide book five provides uh, guidance on how corporates can play uh, their part in nation building and, and which in many ways will help uh, in terms of addressing uh, national security. Uh, 
Uh, so, for example, um, if we get the, this particular chapter uh, where uh, we talk about uh, nation building attributes um, to achieve the desired outcome of uh, having diversified economic structure, advanced productive capabilities, quality and agile uh, talent pool, sustainable and inclusive practices, and trusted institutions, uh, these are all very much aligned uh, to the objectives um, and strategies identified under the National uh, Security uh, Plan. Uh, likewise, um, um, so we're very clear uh, in terms of for corporates, once they're able to execute and be, play a big role in nation building, addressing the issues that I mentioned earlier, uh, they will certainly benefit uh, in terms of uh, having greater supply chain resilience, uh, better talent retention, uh, strengthening the trust and reputation to their organization, and uh, clearly at the end of the day, also it's about enhance business performance in terms of reporting higher revenue, uh, better profit, and then be able to pay more dividend, resulting in better value uh, for uh, for them. Now, uh, back to national security and policy. Uh, if I can offer perhaps uh, some uh, broader uh, perspectives um, in terms of the need for us uh, as a government, as corporate, as society um, to deal with the broader issue of national security. And what I mean by that is they need to take a truly pragmatic approach. Uh, firstly, uh, as a country, it is important for us to maintain sound financial position. What it means is uh, don't overborrow ensure that we continue to enjoy the trade surplus and current account surplus in our balance of payment. So over the past 24 years, it's been great because cumulatively, we've had 2.7 trillion ringgit of trade surplus and 1.5 trillion ringgit of current account surplus. The challenge is that we're not seeing that in the strengthening of our ringgit. Why? Among others, it's because not all these exporters convert their export proceeds into ringgit. My view is actually over the long term, this is something which we must address so that we are able to get these dividends of uh, current consumers in our balance of payment. The commitment towards lowering our fiscal deficit and to maintain healthy foreign reserves, I think that's important. Today, our Banagra reserves is only about half a trillion ringgit, 500 billion ringgit, uh, or 110 uh, billion uh, US dollars. Um, uh, that's actually um, inadequate uh, to me um, because especially given the large current consumers we had. So I think it's my hope that with the right policy, uh, that number can be uh, bigger. And the other would be to be as financially independent uh, as possible, and not to rely on any other people. Secondly, to be resource dependent, uh, resource independent as possible, uh, water, energy, uh, food, uh, number three is about the need to continue with our diversification policy uh, in the structure of our economy, trading partners, source investments, and source of borrowings. Again, the idea is actually not to overdepend on any particular uh, source. Number four is about the need to avoid concentration of investments from a single country into a certain location and to avoid the creation of colonies. Um, I think um, in some of the previous engagements, I mentioned my concern about uh, investment uh, from China, for example, into a certain location uh, where there'll be high concentration of people from the same uh, country, uh, which may pose a national security uh, apart from other security, uh, economic imbalances and, and so on. And likewise, in terms of uh, foreign workers, making sure that you don't allow creation of colonies. Uh, for example, when it comes to say Selayang, um, you know, it's hugely uh, populated the, some areas uh, by uh, people from the Myanmar Rohingya community and so on. Again, uh, never allow creation of such colonies and something which I think uh, people like us must be very uh, about. Uh, not just uh, people in government, but us as citizens. When we see something's not right, we must tell uh, the authorities and avoid that from happening. Likewise, uh, there are certain locations in Puchong where there's a high concentration of uh, people from the African countries and so on. Again, um, these will pose future challenges if you're not careful. Uh, number five is about they need to be sensitive to investment projects which are near geopolitically sensitive areas. Now, um, there were a group of um, Malaysian businessmen um, in Sabah uh, that were pushing for the reclamation project uh, of more than 5,000 acres of land, uh, new islands to be created near Labuan. Now, that's crazy. 
uh, because uh, the proponents of that project, uh, everything will come from China. So imagine, given China's claims on South China Sea, and you allow uh, such uh, you know, huge development um, in that sensitive area, uh, it will create problems. So uh, I think uh, you may think that you can make money as a corporate, but uh, you must bear in mind the national security. So I'm glad that the, that the project uh, was not uh, approved. Number six, about the need to use multilateral approach when dealing with super, superpowers. Uh, I think uh, it is important for us not to be seen to side on one a party uh, continue to maintain our uh, non-aligned uh, you know, uh, approach um, and I think when we are consistent then uh, they will actually respect us. Uh, maintain neutrality and non-aligned approach and uh, the last one is about the need to apply laws and policies firmly, fairly and consistently. So I think this is uh, not just domestically within uh, the country uh, but also when you apply certain policies make sure that you're not seen to be favoring one country uh, over the other, favoring one investor uh, over the other, for example. So let me, uh, Prof. Ranas, uh, perhaps uh, close uh, with this slide. Uh, now, uh, early on, there, were, there was a conversation, um, Dr. Sri Sham spoke about environmental security and so on. So uh, I think uh, it is important for all, all of us to recognize the real threat to the environment. Now, global warming is real. And it is important for all of us to do what we can um, to contain the increase in global temperature to within one and a half degrees or two, two degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial level. Now, uh, if we don't, um, what we see is actually the sea level rise will be so significant uh, that it will affect uh, many coastal areas in Malaysia. So it will threaten not just the economic, uh, you know, uh, businesses and so on, uh, but the livelihood and uh, the lives of people living uh, near the coastal areas. Um, and what that means actually, if uh, let's say the temperature were to go up um, at um, three uh, degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial level, uh, you see many parts of Port Dixon, uh, Klang, um, Pulau Kerry, uh, the lower part of um, uh, Ipoh and so on being underwater. Uh, so I think it's important for all of us uh, to do our part. Now, I had the privilege of uh, visiting Antarctica last year, uh, last November, and uh, the idea uh, was to see uh, the impact of climate change um, in Antarctica. Now, this is a frozen world, it's an ice world. Uh, but from there, uh, we have some scientists on board uh, and we were able to uh, see how many of the glaciers have receded because of global warming. And when um, the glaciers receded, um, the ice will melt and obviously it will actually result uh, in uh, increase in sea level. Um, and the global warming has dis disrupted uh, natural wildlife. So if you look at the study undertaken by WWF, uh, there's a report called Living Planet 2022 uh, where we tracked the uh, loss of um, species uh, from 1970, 1970 until uh, recently, we have seen 69% loss of species. Uh, and that included our Sumatran rhinos in Malaysia, that's now extinct. Um, so when we look at the Antarctica, for example, uh, this photo was captured on my iPhone. Um, you see there are four penguins there. Uh, the three small ones in front and one big one at the back. Now, the three small ones in front, uh, they're called the Gen 2 penguins um, and they are native in the area uh, that I took this photo. But the guy at the back, the big guy, uh, that's actually an emperor penguin. It's a juvenile. That's why it's not visible that they have um, orange uh, in color. Uh, he was not supposed to be there. He was supposed to be miles uh, south, closer to the uh, South Pole. Um, but he was there sesat on his own because of disruption to the natural environment and ecology. So I just wanted to um, you know, just demonstrate this real life example of what we saw in Antarctica. And hopefully uh, it, will be, it will serve as a reminder for us to do what we can to help 
uh, protect the environment and uh, commit ourselves towards net zero. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Those who, those who know me know that I don't like to stand behind a podium, so I'm going to move a bit. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to go very far, it's okay, thank you. Um, uh, you know, the, the problem about coming behind, um, uh, coming after two very distinguished uh, speakers uh, is twofold. The first is that you're coming behind after two very distinguished speakers. Um, so you need to up your game. The second is that you always have to think about what they would have said. Uh, and this happens way before you even write your own speech. So I'm projecting what they would have said um, and then trying very hard not to have that pertinde hand, not to have that overlap. Um, so uh, listening to what they've said, I'm glad that uh, I've prepared it in a different way. Uh, and hopefully this will keep your attention for, and I promise this time, I'm not, I'm not going to speak more than half an hour. I'm going to leave a lot of time for question and answers. Mine is always very, very short. They always say that diplomats don't know when to stop. You finally found one diplomat that really knows how, when to stop. That's the plan, that's the plan. We'll see how far it goes. Um, thank you very much Puspa, uh, uh, to Puspahanas for inviting me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I'd like to start off um, with a, a sort of a, um, a role play, for, uh, if you could. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, I think it's quite juvenile. Um, but if you could just close your eyes and think of the state of the world today. Okay? Now what comes to mind? The state of the world, what is happening in the world today? You have conflict, right? You have uh, food insecurity. You have a lot of people getting very, very angry. Statistics tell us, you can open your eyes, don't worry. <laughs> statistics tell us that, well, there are different statistics. The Council on Foreign Relations, which uh, Professor Faiz was talking about uh, upstairs just now. The Council on Foreign Relations talks about 3.2 billion people in conflict areas. The UN brings it down to 2 billion people. No matter what figures you're looking at, there are only about 7 billion odd of us. So 2 billion is a lot. We're talking about what, one third of us being in conflict areas. So that is one of the major concerns. I'm glad I don't have to talk about environment. It's a very sexy subject, but Tan Sri Wahid has already adequately covered it. Uh, so we'll talk about conflict. And when you talk about conflict, we know what's happening uh, in Gaza, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so it's not just those areas, not those, just those countries. Let me just bring it up. I could. You have a lot of uh, people making a lot of um, projections about where it's not moving. Okay, see? So a lot of uh, academies, a lot of think tanks will tell you uh, the hotspots. So these are the areas that uh, internationally we have to be careful about. And for diplomats, we're extremely careful because these are places that we don't want to go to. Uh, I don't know what the military, apparently sometimes, you know, you rush in where there is conflict. Um, but for us, uh, for diplomats, it's always the case of how do we, in conflict areas, how do we get ourselves and the Malaysians who are 
registered with us who are there out safely. So that's always our main concern. Uh, the, the, the dynamics are different. Now, just to bring it home a bit more, close your eyes again and think about Malaysia. Think about us now. We're living in a very nice, it's not raining today, it's nice and hot. We're living in a nice, comfortable setting. You're sitting down very comfortably, I assume. Some of you have had your eyes closed since before this, you know. So think about what are the threats that we are facing as Malaysians. Okay, I know you've had a few days of this. So what are the threats as Malaysians? What are our threats? Migrants, okay, immigration, porous borders. That's part of the uh, problem. Currency, yes. Ourselves, how are we a threat to ourselves? <laughs> we are, uh, I'll, I'll bring it in a, another way. We have this inherent uh, ability to be intolerant. Our country is one of those countries that is playing a very delicate balancing act. Agreed? You know what I'm talking about. The intolerance is always there, it's latent. It's one of the threats that we don't talk about. But it's something that happens all the time. You do it, I do it. And that is the one that will destroy the fabric of our society, that intolerance. Okay, any other threats? Sorry? Technology. I love technology. It's a good thing. I just uh, found out how to use ChatGPT. After this, I don't have to appear anymore. You can ask ChatGPT. Okay. Um, okay. Um, one thing that I would like to bring up is... Irrelevance. For Malaysia to be in the international stage, to be on the international stage, one thing we don't want to be is irrelevant. Why? Because when we are irrelevant, then people, uh, other countries have the ability to talk over us, that's fine, but they can also make decisions for us. Which is why every time we have the ability, we have the, we have the opportunity to do so, we always take the floor. We tell our diplomats, you must take the floor. Why? We need to keep Malaysia visible. Malaysia has not been visible on the international stage in the last six years. If you go back to the 1990s, to the early 2000s, we were very vis visible. We're a small nation. As, uh, as Professor Faiz said, punching above our weight, but no longer. We've lost those friends that we had. So, when we become irrelevant, then other, other countries will make the decision for us and our voices are not heard. So that, to the diplomatic uh, community, is a threat. Which is why it's so important, you know, we go for functions, we go for so, uh, to socialize. It's not just that. It's always this idea about making sure that we are there, we are heard, we are seen. And that's, that's the one thing that we always try to push our diplomats to do. Take the floor, say something. Even if it's to agree, even if it's to flag uh, a Malaysian position on a particular subject. Now, we were talking about WOGOS, the whole of government and whole of society approach. And we know that the most recent example of a whole of government, whole of society approach is the pandemic. The WHO tells us that had, not, had there not been a whole of government, whole of society, whole of international society approach, we would have fared much worse in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's, it's these things that we think about WOGOS. And we know that it's not something new. 
We've heard from Dr. Isham that it's not something new. Uh, for the UN, we've been talking about it since 2012. So there is a UN DESA uh, paper that talks about how um, WOGOS, the whole of government, whole of society approach, is very important for e-government, for any government to operate, uh, making sure that it, it is te technologically advanced enough to operate, you need the whole of government and whole of society approach. Um, I really need to figure this out. Okay, so we take the floor every single opportunity we get. We make a statement. One of the strongest statements we made was only a few uh, days ago uh, on the, at the UN uh, on the issue of Palestine. Uh, that is worth a listen. And diplomacy. So coming back to, diplo coming to diplomacy, people always say, Diplomacy is all about being nice, um, sometimes. But more importantly, diplomacy, as I said, is about being heard, is about being seen, but also about sending a very clear message. So Malaysia's message, no matter which government is in place, must be the same. We have our principal stand, we have our pragmatic stand, that may change depending on the national security situation. That may change depend, uh, uh, depending upon our interests at that time. But whatever it is, it is, uh, it is a clear and, and unambiguous message that we have to send out. Now, coming back, sorry, not coming back, but bringing it down a little bit more. When we, what we do in the diplomatic field is to canvas for support. Because we believe that every friend is not an accident. Every friendship is not an accident. Um, our friends are friends because they can give us something. Because they will be our contacts at, at some stage. In terms of... Before we go to that. In terms of what we can do. We as Malaysians, we as civil servants, um, even if we're not civilians, uh, we, as the normal, ordinary people, what is it that we can do? The first is all, always increase people-to-people -people communication. Whole of government and whole of society approach rests on this bedrock of communication. If you don't have that communication between the people, then everything else falls. That's one part of it. The second part of it is in syncing the system in which we use. We've had so many different uh, applications, so, so many different platforms within the government. Uh, now we have our, our act in place, we have our MyGov, we have the Hermis, uh, the HRMIS, and that works well across the platform. If someone comes and changes it again, then we're going to have to relearn. This is uh, the same thing that you look at when you have your touch and your touch and go, then you had your smart tech, then our RFID. Every time we renew something and we introduce, rather than improving the old system, we run the risk of losing a few people. So the, the platform in which we use government, the government uses in, um, in the office, must be synced. Now, there is a reason for this. When you talk about communication, the first point that I was making, um, we do our... Uh, I don't know about the Kedah civil service. Do you have? Do you use the Hermes? Ah, okay, great. So you uh, you you use your the Hermes for um, your leave, for declaration, uh, harta. Oh, sorry, I actually did forget. Um, I have a very uh, when uh, Major General Rahim was asking me to please uh, come and give a talk. Um, he didn't have to persuade me after he said the Kedah civil service was going to be here. Uh, I have a very strong affinity for the Kedah Civil Service. My great grandfather, Langkawi Dio, ada, ada. Okay. Uh, my great grandfather was uh, referenced in Tunku Abdul Rahman's um, uh, memoir as that crazy Langkawi Dio before me. So, so that was my affinity. Langkawi juga. Anyway, uh, sorry. Communication, the sinking of the systems. Now, the Hermes system can be used for so much more. 
if we stop thinking of it as just a system. It is a communication tool. For example, if I wanted to know something about um, what Kedah is doing in terms of investment, what is its investment uh, projection, what, what does it want people to invest in, that is where we should be able to talk across the system. Our problem, as Dr. Sri Isham was saying, is a silo mentality. We keep thinking of knowledge as ours. It's not. We need to have the whole of government, whole of society approach. We need to have everybody, every Malaysian on the same page. I might be going to a, uh, to a country that you're not going, but I will be able to carry your interests if I know what it is. And if that knowledge is kept just in your brief and speaking notes, it's not shared, the silo mentality happens, then we lose that opportunity. If you, if you look at uh, diplomats and uh, civil servants like Singapore, for example, they share across the board. They share. So when they go abroad, when they go international, they're speaking in one language. And I mean that metaphorically. They're speaking on the same page. They're fighting for the same thing. Whereas we're not sure what it is that we're fighting for. And we can't these days say, for example, oh, that's not my department. It's another country's department. Oh, it's another, sorry, it's another department. It's no longer possible. When we go out, we're still Malaysians. So they're all, always asking. Uh, especially when we're at the embassy, you're expected to, ask, uh, you're expected to know a bit about the nuclear uh, energy. You're, you need to know about education. You need to know about a whole lot of things. And it's not our expertise. So come, we'll come to my second point, which is to develop subject matter experts. Not only develop, this is something that I know you've heard so many times in your career, not only develop the subject matter experts, but also to ensure that they are placed correctly. Sometimes we have ministries where the minute you see a colleague who has developed a particular expertise, uh, then let's challenge them by moving them somewhere else. Whereas you have in the developed world, in uh, Western countries, an expert who remains an expert in that field or in that subject matter throughout his or her career. So by the time he or she goes uh, to the international stage, they, are, they know that uh, subject inside out. They don't have to relearn it. That's the, that's the second thing that I was uh, going to make, um, subject matters. The third, and this will be the last point, I promise, um, is a change of attitude. We spoke about the silo. We, talk, we, we need to change our attitude. We need to change our mindset. Uh, knowledge is to be shared. It's not to be kept. There's no use of keeping it. It's not, it's not like money keeping, uh, keeping it in the bank. So we need to share that knowledge. We need to broaden our horizons. No more hoarding of information. Uh, if we hear something, if we see something, tell someone about it. Tell the relevant authorities about it. And that works even in international, on the international stage. You might go to a reception that you hear, oh, um, Singapore is bringing um, a case to the International uh, Court of Justice against Malaysia. Tell someone about it. This is exactly what happened uh, with our case on Pulau Batu Putih. Six months before uh, we actually filed, um, there was a reception and there was a former judge there from Malaysia uh, and he stood witness when a Malaysian told the Singaporean, oh, we're going to file against you. Sure enough, when we wanted to look for a document uh, in the UK, we couldn't find it because it was no longer there. They had already done their due diligence. They had gone first. But they were all on the same page. We have to think about, A, not hoarding, but also not divulging too much. Sometimes we like people to like us, so we talk a lot. Um, that 
presents a problem when we are asked to do more socializing because it's only through socializing, through meeting with people, through communicating with people that we get more information. And sometimes it's just these tidbits of information that uh, make up a whole um, picture. It's like playing jigsaw puzzle. You get something, I'll get something. Hopefully, we can get a better picture, but only if that information is shared. If it's not, then it just becomes useless. The most important thing, I think, for the whole of government and whole of society approach is this building of trust. How do we build trust? We don't hoard. We share information. We have to trust our colleagues when we give them a brief and speaking notes, when we give them information about a particular issue that they are not going to sell it, that they are not going to misuse it, that they are going to help us get to where we need to go. So that trust needs to be built. So finally, this idea in international relations is always uh, the best way of motivating a country against um, another country or motivating a whole society against uh, a particular subject is always that us versus them. We've seen it uh, with Madeleine Albright, but us versus them. We've seen it with Bill Clinton, uh, sorry, with um, George Bush. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Us versus them. That is the most powerful thing in international relations. But for us, whole of government, whole of society approach, we have to think of us as all of us in Malaysia and them as all of them outside. Same page, talk the same language, build that trust, work on communications, make sure that our platforms are all syncing, syncing together and those are the things that inshallah will make us uh, be able to move Malaysia to greater heights or at least to get back to where we, we, we should have been. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dato. Um, well, in the study, in our study of national power, of course, diplomacy is one of the most important uh, elements. So it is uh, most appropriate that you are here to expose to all of us uh, the uh, intricacies of uh, diplomacy. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we proceed now to the Q&A. Um, Oh, really? Well, <laughs> um, so we have uh, here quite a number of uh, questions. Um, shall we shall we take this first or from the floor? Okay, um, we start with uh, questions from the floor. Um, any uh, question to any of the panelists? Uh, please state uh, your name and your institution. Uh, Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera. Uh, yang bagi Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, Datuk Datuk, Tuan Tuan dan Puan. My name is Kena Mat. I'm from uh, Military Training Academy, NDUM. Uh, thank you for the fruitful session. My question is for Professor Dr. Muhammad Faiz Abdullah. <coughs> Prof, normally practices, sometimes objectives come with phases of or timeline in order to declare achievement. So my question is, Prof, from your point of view, do you think we should create, it, create a yardstick as a guide to declare war goals fully implemented or achievable? Thank you, Dr. Um, any, oh, you, you dedicate your question to Professor Prof. Faiz? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sorry, you are Colonel? Colonel Razman. Colonel, eh? Okay. Colonel Razman, thank you very much. Oh, well, your question is very enlightening. Uh, at the same time, is a 
what we call trying to answer that question is to try to catch a, a falling sword. You could be very, very fast, and then you could get yourself cut both ways. I say so because the very nature of Vogos suggests what we call dynamism. And when you have dynamism, by definition, you cannot set a timeline. Because if you set a timeline, it would assume that Vogos is finite. Whereas circumstances are never finite. And there is a great saying that in the fourth industrial revolution, for example, where the only constant is change. In fact, what is being said that because of that, remaining stationary is going backwards. So perhaps I think what you are really getting at is what is the best way of optimizing our resources so as to be able to achieve that golden mean in order to reach Wagos. My answer is this. Number one, I have already given three, which are too theoretical perhaps, but if we stick on to that falling principle, I think we're safe. It is to be aware of what is around us. I have really cautioned that uh, Wagos doesn't mean colony of ants working in unison because we are not generated purely by instinct. As human beings, we are generated first by motivation, secondly through learning, and thirdly through rationalization. Rationalization means we are able to assess a situation, make the proper appraisal, and respond to the circumstance. One of the first principles in strategic management, which I fortunately have been able to teach for the last 15 years, is that there is a big difference between strategy and tactics. In fact, your question is so fundamental, it involves what we call the timeline of strategy, which means there is no timeline. What is most important is that, are we there all the time? Meaning, when we do something, are we aware that we're doing it wholly, completely, back to Wagos? So that is the answer I would like to give you. And frankly, if anybody would tell me that We've got a five-year, ten-year timeline. We're going to achieve Vogos. I think that could be a little bit exaggerated, with all due respect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. I think I'm going to alternate a uh, question between from the floor and from uh, the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, we have one question from a gentleman by the name of Abdul Halim Jalal. I, I suspect this is uh, Lieutenant General Dato Abdul Halim or whoever. Um, okay, now this is what he uh, said. He said he's interested in what the Secretary General of MINDEF mentioned in his keynote address of a maestro orchestrating his band, musicians, to produce music that is soothing to the ears. Taking cue from that, question is, who or what, in your opinion, best play the maestro's role in Malaysia? So that, uh, like maestro, uh, who is a musical specialist and well-respected by musicians, can harmonize the Wogos concept among government agencies and all societies. Um, so, uh, we leave it to the three panelists to answer uh, this uh, question. Uh, yeah, uh, three. Yeah, who best uh, play the role? Thank you. Take, uh, is it okay? Yeah. Should be all right, yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that question, the, the two. Um, now, uh, I would just like to look at it from at the various organizational level. At the national level, obviously, the, 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 the maestro, the conductor, uh, is um, the prime minister. Right? Um, then he will then coordinate across the whole government machinery, inspire the corporate sector and the society as well. 
Now, within the government itself, uh, I would say is the KSN, right? Uh, so he's able to then um, orchestrate uh, within the various ministries and so on. And within the, each ministry, of course, uh, then you have the various agencies on that. Now, in respect of the corporate sector, so if you talk about, say, uh, Maybank, for example, then it's got that commercial banking arm, the business banking arm, um, and then uh, the retail uh, and so on. So uh, he's then able to actually coordinate the, um, the orchestra so that every single person in that the orchestra will then be able to actually fulfill the function. So again, uh, next year at the national level, it will have to be the prime minister. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, agree with uh, Tan Sri Wahid, but only to a certain extent. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, the technocrats, the uh, civil servants, um, it, it still is the Prime Minister. Because of whatever the Prime Minister, we, we are still a hierarchical society. Whether we like to admit it or not, case system, we're still hierarchical. Whatever the Prime Minister says, goes. So um, I'll give you an, a recent example. Um, one of the things that the foreign ministry has been uh, grappling with uh, in the last few years has been this uh, devolution of power. So every single ministry now has an international affairs division. And of course, if you have an international affairs division, they're going to want to do their own international affairs things. Um, the problem was not so much that they did the international affairs things, but that they did not report it back. So there was no cohesive approach to our international relations because um, MOHE would do something uh, and then MO MOA would do something else. So that was a problem. So when uh, the PMX came to power, he reinstituted or he reminded us again uh, and he made sure that it happened that all communications with uh, when it comes to international uh, relations should send a copy. It's not you have to go through with small patrol like in the old days because now everything is very fast, but at least extend a copy to with small patrol so that we would know what's happening. So that it, when we are preparing a speech uh, or whatever, we'll take all these things that other agencies have done into account. It comes into the speech of the prime minister as well. So you don't have to uh, start looking around for it. So it's still, um, it's still a very top heavy thing. Uh, Prime Minister is the maestro, um, and it, it actually doesn't matter who it is, it's always the post. The post gives a lot of power, uh, and what the post says, goes. Thank you. I, I, I thought I could, could I, yeah, thought I, like, work on this. Uh, is this. Is this on? Uh, I'd like to take the liberty of uh, agreeing, partly, yeah, with uh, Dr. Shah's agreeing partly with uh, Tansri. But I would rather stand back and uh, look at it from a different perspective. I think the, the way the question has been contextualized, I think the person asking is setting a bit of a trap here. Yeah, the way I look at it is uh, the correct question would be, is there such a thing as a maestro? that can handle Wargos. I think by virtue of the conception of Wargos, it means there are groups of maestros handling groups of circumstances in relation to certain groups of situations, confronting groups of challenges. I think that is the best approach. And in so doing, and in so saying, yeah, certainly I'm not trying to relegate the role of the Prime Minister. I've been the last person, you know, I've been appointed by the Prime Minister to, do, to, to, to hate ISIS. What I'm trying to say is that even the Prime Minister would not be in a position to think that he could be the maestro of Wargos. Because the whole very idea of Wargos is to have interaction, coordination, dynamic exchange. But you need to have capable maestros within the respective groups. Perhaps in saying so, the best lesson to learn is that Unless you want to be the emperor. In certain societies, you can have the emperor. I don't need to name names. But for that particular structured society, yeah, the emperor or the new emperor is able to crack the whip with a whole load of very strong sanctions. 
we are working in a constitutional democracy, not a liberal democracy, of course, but where the doctrine of complete autocracy, dictatorial style, will not gel. And I don't believe anyone, whether opposition or whether with the government, should really think that that should be the style. I hope that answers uh, that, that particular question that was given. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any question from the floor? Uh, if not, I'll... Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, a mic, please. Can we, no, no, we need to, oh, all right, yeah, yeah. I think we should have a lot of walking mics. Uh, tak dengar, tak dengar. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nazman from the Kedah State. Uh, my question goes to uh, Professor Dr. Faiz. I'm, I'm trying to touch something about the regulatory framework. Every department, agencies have their own regulations and some regulations are not talking to each other. So, do you think that the regulatory framework also contributed to the failure of WOGOS? Thank you. Very brilliant question, yeah. Uh, in fact, I had prepared some notes on that because, uh, you know, Prof. Rana was giving me like times up and all that. So I had to skip. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. I will speak first of all from the angle of a lawyer. Laws are made to confuse people. So the lawyers will have a lot of money in the courts, right? But uh, to be very serious, regulations are essential for any civilization. Uh, even the so called no, neoliberals or the libertarians of the United States have decided that they need laws to enable the country to force people to recognize them. So there you go again. But your point is quite clear. It goes to the root causes. What we need is, in a certain extent, a reset, first of all, of the Parliamentary Draftsman Committee. Because the regulations proceed from the primary laws. Primary laws are from Parliament, and Parliament comes out with acts, they are called statutes, at the federal level. Yeah, except for land matters, except for religious matters, anything from Parliament will affect every other state as well. So from there, the regulations flowing from the state, uh, flowing from the federal, the, the regulations flowing from the federal statutes prevail even over the state legislatures when it comes to those, except for those, like I said, in relation to specific matters pertaining to land, pertaining to matters dealing with Islam, and certain other matters pertaining to customs. So, perhaps you're not pointing to anything exact, but I can tell you exactly for certain things. For example, fiscal laws, taxation, the state has no say, right? The federation is there, it's in the constitution. The state has got certain so-called fiscal abilities to tax by way of giving licenses. Smallholders having to pay up for this, uh, this kind of token and that kind of token. What happens if a state wants to really project itself? Let's put it this way. What happens if, say, the state of Kedah wants to increase their revenue through collection? They can't go through corporate tax. They can't go through income tax. So what they end up doing is to try to impose levies and other sort of so-called chukai, yeah, and certain parts in relation to land, that generally helps to bring in the most, in good times, 30% of the state revenue. What about the 70%? In the end, it will have to rely on, number one, budget allocations from the Federation, it will have to rely on their own particular deals, state versus perhaps even third countries. And that is where the problem comes in, even without touching on the regulation. So my answer to you is that regulations must be able to be, coming back to the same question, inherently dynamic, allowing for amendments, allowing for changes. And for regulations to take place, you must have the mother acts. In the case of the state legislation, you must have the state 
act first before it goes on to the regulations? Uh, it's not a simple answer. The way it has been done that we have really have independence you know, since 1957. The question is what has been done in that? That is a question that has to be addressed by the AG chambers, by address to be advised through all the legal advisors of the state, come down, sit down, find out what is wrong with that and work with those who are really on the field. Work with the economies, work with the business traders, work with the small traders, work with the cultural people. And of course, in the end, you have to work with the state religious uh, authorities as well. I think that's the short answer I can give. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm playing a coordinator here. One of my Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, we'll take questions from uh, the sky or virtual. Um, here are two questions for Tan Sri Wahed. Uh, from Amy Chu. Number one, food security. There's an increase in food imports at the time of a weakening ringgit contributing to food uh, inflation. How much is being spent on food imports to date? Number two, you highlighted the coastal regions which may be underwater due to climate change. These areas are also part of Malaysia's industrial heartland. Uh, what steps are being taken by the government uh, right now? Okay, that's for uh, Tansri. Let me read another question so that uh, any one of you may answer. Um, from Colonel Muzaffar. Uh, in, a, uh, in aligning, calibrating and evolving our nation towards a WOGOS uh, defense ecosystem, um, what is the best approach, structural, philosophical, or cultural? Right, the three questions, but the first two dedicated to you, Dancer. Sorry. Yes, one to zero. The question from Amy. Um, I think uh, first of all, in terms of uh, food import bill, I'm afraid I don't have uh, the the figures. But I think uh, it is important for us to uh, look at um, our uh, food production capacity. Uh, there are some food items that uh, we need uh, to make sure that we have uh, enough of, uh, and that will require some policy uh, adjustments. Uh, especially when it comes to staple food. But having said that, there are some uh, products where uh, it is better and more economically produced uh, outside of the country. So I think um, the idea would be to leverage on economics, uh, whilst at the same time making sure that's uh, appropriate uh, to govern uh, the arrangements between one uh, country uh, and another. Uh, so. Having said that, um, this is where um, I spoke about the need to uh, diversify uh, our sources. Uh, I mean, I think the back uh, is weak. Thank you. This is the third mic of the work. Um, sorry, for, for the, the, the other question from Amy was in respect to what the government is doing. Uh, the, the, the cost of, yeah. So I think, um, uh, thank you, Prof. Now, um, I, I can't speak for the government per se, but within the context of a whole of uh, nation uh, kind of approach, uh, it is important for all of us to do our part uh, at the global level, at national level, corporate and society level. Um, so there, is, there are two parts to address uh, the impact of climate change. One is what we call mitigation. Uh, the other one is what we call adaptation. Now, mitigation is actually number one, is we need to do what we can to reduce the uh, rise in global temperature 
uh, to within one and a half or two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial level. And one of the main causes of global warming is the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we emit um, globally. Now, the good thing is that there's already global commitment. Countries representing 90% of global GDP have already committed to uh, be net zero in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. Mid-century refers to 2050 or 2060. And that includes Malaysia, uh, which made this commitment in September 2021, uh, when the Prime Minister then tabled the 12th uh, Malaysia plan. So as early as 2050, will be net zero. Now, it is our hope that with all the collective effort of all countries in the world, we'll be able to contain uh, this rise in temperature to within two degrees centigrade. So that's what we call uh, mitigation, and that will have to be done at the corporate level to be net zero at society uh, level too. Now, the other one, uh, adaptation, means that we must be prepared that, again, based on science, uh, based on the IPCC report data that we have seen, chances are we're not going to keep it within one and a half degrees. Uh, I think it's beyond that, almost. Uh, two degrees, also tough. Mm. So, therefore, we must start to look at, okay, how do we adapt? Uh, because we know that uh, it will rise. And that will mean that uh, we therefore have got to align our policies and build, uh, develop technology, the flood miti uh, mitigation uh, projects, for example, uh, especially in the East Coast, for example, that needs to be expedited. Um, so whenever we approve a particular development, take into account of these potential rises. Um, and therefore, uh, for, for some of the plantations, uh, being prepared that there must be that you know dikes and so on uh, be, being built and so on and uh, in some cases it may require relocation and so on so again these are some of the adaptation measures that we have to undertake um, at the uh, government national and uh, corporate level as well thank you okay thank you what about the third um, if i could just uh, touch on the uh, on food and I'll leave the philosophical question to Professor Faiz um, just uh, you I think we we all know that we uh, that Malaysians as a whole we waste a lot of food the food wastage alone uh, what was the figures that we could feed 2.2 million people three meals a day for a year that's staggering so it comes back to that that idea of changing our mindset if we are living in a in a world that is at risk that a world uh, it, which is reaching its, uh, its uh, um, breaking point because of the number of people that we have, because of the, uh, the limited resources that we have, then we have to change our mindset. Perhaps um, eat less rice. I don't know, for Malaysians. Um, talking about rice, I, I wanted to bring in that uh, thing. Um, I'm very confused because one of the, one of the um, negotiations that we are currently having is with India. Now, uh, Dr. Sri Isham was mentioning about the ban um, of, um, of rice that India is doing. It's a blanket ban. It's not against us, but it's a blanket ban. We've managed to, to secure about 170,000 tons, metric tons of, of rice, of white rice, non-basmati, white rice. Uh, that goes all the way into March 2024. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture says that, well, uh, maths uh, tells us that, well, we need about 500,000. So 170,000 metric tons is not going to cut it. We talk to Ministry of Economy, they say, well, we don't actually have a problem. We're just hoarding. So um, I'm, I'm very confused. Uh, I'd like to think, uh, no, I, uh, I'd like to think that the middle path is the correct answer. That uh, if we are frugal enough, if we are careful enough, we won't need that much rice. Uh, that's just on, on the rice part. I'm sure there are lots of other agricultural products, there are lots of uh, things that we can substitute rather than have more spinach, which is imported. We have more kangkong, which is not imported. So it's just that change of mindset for the whole of, uh, well, this is less whole of government, more whole of society approach. Um, if we have less, then we eat. Then we need to eat less. Uh, same thing with our finances. I think. Well, I mean, our personal finances. If we have less money, 
then we can't um, enjoy ourselves all that much. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, Faiz, would you respond to this one? Yeah, um, in aligning, calibrating and evolving our uh, nation towards a uh, Wogos defense ecosystem, what is the best approach? This is multiple choice, huh? structural, philosophical or cultural? Okay, well, I think you do a take a philosophical question, that would really be all-encompassing. Like I said, there is no one magic bullet in order to achieve the things that we want to achieve. That's the whole idea of having Wogos. But it could be uh, productive for us to remember when it comes to the philosophical part. Uh, the great Harvard philosopher by the name of John Rawls, he came out with a doctrine in his theory of justice which says that the doctrine of overlapping consensus. So you have different ministries, different agencies, different needs, and if I'm looking from the defense ecosystem, so the defense ecosystem would be structurally centered from the what we call the point of power, which would be the ministry. Now the ministry must consider what would be their priority interests. Having singled out their priority interests, they would see which are the areas where their interests would overlap the interests of the other organs, agencies, or other ministries. And having figured that out, they must come with what we call an overlapping consensus, which is basically to say that while their interests may have greater priority or may prevail over the interests of other ministries, which is naturally so. Because the MINDAV will have its particular interest in mind, and some of those interests may not even overlap, but may clash with the interests of the other ministries. So the way to go about it, to answer this question, to evolve the best approach, is to find that overlapping consensus. And this is where you have the cabinet. This is where you have the steering committees to sort out all these issues at the most fundamental level so that once that is agreed, the implementation will be much smoother. I'm very generic in the answers because we are not having a specific detailed question. So my generic answer is that use the principle of overlapping consensus, taking in mind what are your interests and what will be the interests of the others, surrounded by the overall war cost principle and see how you could pursue it. I already said some part of it earlier in my presentation when I talk about the need in the case of uh, our defense, how much is needed, some basic numbers have to be skewed up and obviously we got to keep up with the rest of our regional neighbors. I think that's the best okay. as I could, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Now, uh, I've been given stern warning by and that we should stop now. Nevertheless, I seek your indulgence one minute because I, I want to read to you the question uh, from netizens. Very interesting. Four questions. One, uh, from Noshima, uh, government servant. Question is, how can a balance be struck between transparency and secrecy in a Wogos approach to security? Very, very legitimate. Question two from Yasmin, uh, a lecturer. How can trust be built between the government and the public to foster a cooperative WOGOS environment for national security purposes? Question three from Nazreen, uh, UITM. What role does public education play in the uh, WOGOS approach to national security? And final question uh, from Dr. Edwina. What measures are necessary to approach? So I leave uh, uh, to you think about the answers because, well, you are all involved in that. And uh, with that, um, I would like to thank 
our distinguished uh, speakers, panelists, uh, for this very, very uh, exciting thing, uh, session. So uh, please uh, let's show our appreciation in the normal way. This, this might want to. Thank you, Professor. As we draw this session to a close, I would like to extend a warm invitation to Yang Berbahagia, Major General Datuk Haji Muhammad Nizam bin Haji Jaafar, Commandant of the National Resilience College, to share his concluding remarks. Following this, he will be honoured to present a memento to each of our esteemed panel members as a token of our gratitude. Please, Yang Berbahagia Datuk, grace us with your words. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum sekali lagi uh, Vice Admiral Datuk Sabri Ben Zali President National Center of Defense Studies Yang berhormat Datuk Sri Haji Norizan Ben Ghazali Kedah State Secretary Yang berbagi Tan Sri Wahid Umar Chairman Bursa Malaysia Yang berbagi Profesor Dr. Muhammad Faiz uh, Bin Abdullah Chairman ISIS Malaysia Yang bagi Datuk Dr. Shazlina Zainal Under Secretary of South and Center Asia Division MOFA Jed Nazim bin Abrahman CEO of Defense Service Asia First Admiral Baluridin bin Taha The Commandant of Malaysia Defense College Datuk Sri Datuk Sri Datuk Datuk Ladies and Gentlemen Allow me to conclude the wonderful Interesting and lively session that we have today Including particularly Question and answer session Despite the setback of the microphone the presence of the Secretary General earlier and the other eminent speakers have certainly made the whole effort worthwhile. We have the privilege listening to all these influential speakers in Malaysia's strategic landscape and their reputation have transcended across our boundaries. The stylish and flair of Dr. Professor, Professor Dr. Faiz suggested that we deciphering our approach and relook into the history and the mere existence of Vogos. He urged to look into the government method in interpretations of the concept itself. I would like also to quote my uh, alma mater, et bellum pis parati, meaning prepared in peace for war. And you have eloquently delivered what Vogos today, and I really felt your presence today, Professor. For Tansi Abdul Wahid, <coughs> A corporate um, icon, very eloquent speaker, always respect him, um, daily basis try to find whatever he says, whatever he writes in the article, try to read through and try to understand his food of thought. The core value and threat stressing the need for us to speak out the language and same and sharing the same end state. The need for the corporate to play more important role in fostering the values of Wogos and aligning to Mandani economic framework. Dr. Shazlina Zainal Abidin, the career diplomat, who knows when to stop? A new breed of diplomat, I may say, stressing on the world of conflict. I close that you mentioned, Doctor, is a pandemic that we are suffering from day one, that we are very, uh, having very much difficulties to overcome it. Consistency in our standing in international arena and people-to-people -people communications versus silo mentality. And I will also to extend my warmest thanks and gratitude to Madam Moderator, Professor Rohana Sarun, uh, who have been with us and have been managing the whole session excellent and very well. And I would like to say thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me to give the biggest round of applause to the panel members. <laughs> and I would like to have a small momentous to give away for the panelists as well as Madam Moderator.
And thank you, Yang Bagian for your insightful closing remarks and for bringing this event to a fitting conclusion. With that, we have reached the end of our seminar. It is our sincere hope that you found the discussions enlightening and the seminar overall a rewarding experience. Thank you for your engagement and participation. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And salam sejahtera.